We're back on the big show. It's very rare that you get to interview someone you're interested in or someone who's got a story to tell or someone who's worth talking to. But today's an exception. Laurie Mansfield, how are you? <laughs> Thank you very much for the introduction. It's lovely to talk to you. i tell you why. A, because I'd love to be in your mind for just 10 minutes. The stories you must have. And then we look at what you're doing today. You're still current. You're still booking people. You've still got a huge agency. And everybody in the business sings to your tune, more or less, because <laughs> you know what you're doing. You do it well and you've done it for a long time. There aren't many people left like you are there really well i don't know you make me sound like ken dodd in a sense <laughs> I, i'm still doing it after all these years and people are saying why i've been very lucky to be truthful with you to do what i love doing and i still love doing it and you don't sort of think of age when you do uh, what you enjoy and i've been very fortunate that i've been able to be involved in all parts of the business from management and agency to theater producing i've even made a couple of movies so i i, I that side of it keeps me going there's always something left that I want to do and I want to achieve and as you know at this time of the year I'm deeply involved with the Royal Variety Show which is another thing that uh, keeps me busy and what are you at heart then are you starstruck are you a performer at heart that you do that vicariously through your acts are you a businessman what are you I'm starstruck. Originally, the reason I'm in this business is because I'm starstruck and I'm not able to do what stars can do. I can't <laughs> perform per se. I just can't do it. I wish I could. And I can occasionally entertain two or three people with stories or what have you, but I cannot perform. I love comics more than anything else because I admire what they do. And so I suppose I've learned to be on the stage vicariously, as you rightly say, other people, and to advise people and to see and to help make things happen is a great thrill. But at the end of it, if I can't be on the stage, I want to be near the stage. Is that a thrill for you that not only you want to work with them, but they want to work with you? There's always an element of realism locked into why anybody wants to work with anybody. It's kind of, what can you do for me today? Uh, but I, the stars that I've worked with, I've worked with a long time. You know, Ronnie Corbett's been with The Office a long time. Jim Davidson I had from before. He was with New Faces. Jim and I were working together with the likes of, of Jimmy Tarbuck, with Shane Ritchie. All these guys have been with The Office a long time. And then you get real pleasure of knowing you're in it. Longevity builds relationships, and relationships will hold people together. And so as long as their talent, which is immense, can be channeled in the right way, and we, The Office, do the job properly, then you get great pleasure from knowing, frankly, you change people's lives. Not only with the artist, but the, uh, the people that come and see and enjoy. And you, you give them something, a night out, or they go and see a show. You actually make them think, you know, I'm better for seeing that. Mm. And you mentioned Jim Davison there, and he's a brilliant stand-up. He's the consummate professional, but he gets himself into bother from time to time. Is your job to manage that and to make sure that his entertainment and his product speaks louder than his opinions, if you like? That's uh, that's a tricky question to to answer uh, to answer simply. Jim Davison is probably the most talented, naturally talented performer that I've ever worked with. And he is the finest stand-up comedian this country has. And he is his own man. Now, you can't change that. You can channel it a little. You can bring the opportunities to the fore, and he can take those opportunities and move forward. And we've learned to live alongside of each other. He once said a really very wise thing to me early on in our relationship, uh, when it, back in the days when adult entertainment didn't always exist and we were doing summer seasons and we were doing one-nighters where children, because Jim has always been a television performer, and I said, I'm not sure you can tell that joke. I'm not sure you can say that. I think you can. And he said to me, listen, Laurie, do yourself a favour. Don't try and live your act through me. Hmm. I am my own man. And that's an absolute truth. And after that, it really made me think. And after that, we started to do shows with a site like movies, with almost an X certificate of over 18s only. And that's when we both started to think we can maybe move show business in a slightly different way. And Jim was the first to do a summer season that had that kind. It was not a family show, 
but like a film could play in Torquay for the summer and be uh, X certificate or whatever it was then, we also did that kind of thing and said, don't bring children to this because they won't like it. And so I don't have to worry about offending the audience that come and my audience. And so we narrow casted in a time when it was a very, it's very, na- you know, it happens all the time now. But in those days, it was new. So we, we really did grow together and learn to trust each other, I think. What is your opinion now on show business? It it seems to me there's somewhat of a drought. I tend not to interview people under 30. I probably prefer to interview people over 50 because they don't seem to understand that this is show business and that even though we're sat here now, you've got to have a certain amount of enthusiasm and be relatively interesting and give something of yourself. That seems to have been lost now, doesn't it? Yes, I think that's true. I think the problem is that, you know, way back when, television felt it had a need to entertain all of the people all of the time and cost was secondary and i think now we live in an era where cost is paramount and the cost of shows advertising is not as easy to get as it was and so therefore television cuts its cloth accordingly and looks in different directions and so the kind of artists that were big stars in the 70s and the 80s don't have that window anymore to perform to a public that public is still there whether you're even chubby brown you know there are an audience that will come along and see you it exists in the west end the lion king plays to that kind of an audience but television doesn't fulfill that need it's happier now with five six million viewers and that is considered to be a hit whereas before 20 years ago that wouldn't even moved off the radar and then of course the big event of the year is the royal variety something that for my entire life i've looked forward to it's a charity event people forget that it is serving a purpose to raise money for your charity, which we'll talk about next. But just putting it together, how do you decide who gets on and who doesn't? Well, I'd listen. I'd love to claim all of the credit for the Royal Variety Show and take all the, but it isn't. It's it's a very very much a joint venture. The television company, whether it's ITV or the BBC, are deeply involved in who's going to be on, who's not going to be on, and we use the contacts that we all have to put that bill together and. It, it, it more it starts as one raw variety show finishes the next raw variety show starts I am already talking now with ITV who do the show next year and the hardest part initially in truth is not who's on it but where do we do it because we are so lucky this year that Andrew Lloyd Webber has let us have the Palladium because it's the first time we've been at the Palladium for many, many years. and he. But it's the first time also we've not done the show on a Monday. We always tape the show on a Monday night. And uh, because traditionally it was the thinnest night for the theatre to close. So they would be happy for you to have it on a, on a Monday night. This year it's on a Thursday. So, so we can have all of the week to rehearse and routine. So the sound of music's off, off is it? For four nights. It's that week, uh, we are December the 11th, I think, so from Monday of that week, The Sound of Music is off when the theatre's dark to enable the BBC to go in and set up because historically the show used to be rehearsed on a Sunday when the theatre mm-hmm. was dark and played on a Monday. Now we need four or five days minimum to get everything set up, rehearsed and played within that. And then the acts that you decide to put on, it seems like there's a tier system. You try and deliberately put in people we haven't heard of who are great, because that then gives them a platform. We then need a legend. How many people say no? Because I can't imagine if you're asked to do it that you would say no, because it's such a marvellous event to be part of, and it's royal, and of course it's the event of the year in terms of theatre in the UK. I mean, we really haven't had any entertainment TV for the last 10 years or so. It, It is, and it's interesting that... Very few people do say no. People have reservations. One of the great things that has been done in my time that I claim a small amount of credit for, at least, is that we've involved the music industry in making it realise it's a great showcase for their artists. And also that has brought down the sort of age, average age of the viewer. And instead of being locked into what a lot of people call yesterday's style of entertainment, I wouldn't agree with that, but I understand it. Uh, by bringing the record companies into and supporting it, we've now been able to say to this show has relevance to pop acts, rock acts. So they, from Rod Stewart down, are happy to go on the show and plug either their album, the single, or their, or their past history uh, within it. It's comedians that that have the biggest reservation because they play to an unknown audiences, mm. and comedians 
like a comfort factor. And when you walk out onto a stage that is not yours, when it's an audience that have paid up to £250 for a ticket, who wouldn't necessarily want to come and see you, and you've got to get a laugh, they're the ones that, I and I understandably for me, think, is this going to do me good or harm? Because it's going to be seen by, even though I'm playing to 2,000 people here, the end result is going to be seen by millions. And so they sometimes think to themselves, do I really want to do this? But I have never known, and I, I'm not making this up, I have not known historically anybody ever say no when asked. Outside of, I'm not in the country, you know, I'm not available, I'm busy doing something else. But when they're available, the honour is great. And the fascinating thing is, um, Britain's Got Talent, where all these young performers, and I know both ITV and Simon Cowell was concerned, was the prize of being on the Royal Variety Show enough? And the other prize is £100,000. I've, I've been to both series now not once have i heard anybody mention the money they all want to do the royal variety show and these are young young performers who you would think would say or might say well what's it to do with me what's the relevance to my life but they are so desperately keen to meet the queen or to perform for prince charles now that's a big turnaround for a show that 25 years ago people mm. had thought has it outlived its time is there any point of it anymore? How do they keep their nerve and who helps them with that? It's Again, it's, it is interesting because you would think the final of Britain's Got Talent, uh, 12 million viewers, people that you want to vote for, you're in a, your, your career lies in front of you. And yet the nerves that those performers feel there are nothing to the nerves they have on a Royal Variety show. And I think it is... The, the legend that is the Royal Variety Show, the, the awareness when, you, when you're about to perform, thinking, my God, this is what performers dream of, to perform on this show. And alongside of you is the creme de la creme of worldwide talent. And I, I, I've got to be as good as they are. I think the event pushes forward, pushes beyond mm. ambition, yeah. beyond the desire to do well. But you think, I can't believe this is happening this is it and i think it's double at the palladium i think there is that feeling of being absolutely in that theater it's a show business palace and sure. how do you feel is it a sense of pride is it a sense of anxiety for the performers to do as well as they deserve to do and that they deliver for themselves as well as you and the audience what is your personal emotion i never ever except and this is one of my own clients of course but i never ever worry about the talent i have gr enormous faith in the a the television uh, producers, the directors, the talent itself. I, I don't concern myself with that. And I've, I've never been let down, in truth. Badly, badly let down in that area. But the, to be sat next to Her Majesty the Queen, I, I don't care what anybody... I'm telling you, that's nerve-wracking. This is a regal lady. And it's a mixture of sort of not wanting to put your foot in it and say something <laughs> utterly stupid, which is very, you know, is easily done when your mouth is dry and your top mm. lip stuck to your teeth. And the other is an immense amount of pride that, because, you know, my home's in Birmingham, or was in Birmingham, I should say. And I was brought up, you know, in, like most of us, in fairly ordinary. So I, if my mother and father were alive to see me stood in that box at that time, and I always think that, whether mm. it's with Prince Charles or whatever, that. Uh, that, that's a road that many people are not lucky enough uh, to travel. So there is an enormous sense of pride in just being able to say, I've been there and, and do this. I get, I get a real buzz from that, mixed with, as I say, with nerves. Prince Charles is lovely and much easier, but the Queen is the Queen. Mm. And she always will be. And that's the difference, isn't it? But even at our level, meeting the stars you meet every day, it is a bizarre feeling, isn't it? Yes. And a great privilege, I think, yeah. just to get a few minutes with somebody. It is. It, the hardest part of all with that is when you truly admire somebody and you get to meet them, you know, and they're not my clients or whatever, not my workplace, you want to somehow be able to say, look, I'm not making this up. I'm not just saying it because you're here and you're, and everybody says it. But I really do think you are 
fantastic and I am so thrilled just to be in the same room mm. and you mm. can't do it without it sounding like you are, you're making it up almost and it is very difficult to, to say you don't know the pleasure you've given me mm. and the thought of me I, I met uh, Sylvester Stallone <laughs> I, I went to his uh, hotel room uh, when he came across for the uh, the Rocky the last Rocky picture and again you think I can't believe I'm sat here <laughs> <laughs> Tim, it's it's Rambo. I mean, and you just want to say, look, don't say anything. I just want to tell you, I can't believe this is happening to me. This after all the years I've done it. So it, it is, it is bizarre. It is not natural to be able to. You can, if, if you get to know people, then that's fine. But that first meeting with somebody you've always admired, I couldn't have. I'm, I was very lucky to meet Frank Sinatra, and but I could no more have called him Frank. Than, than fly to the moon I just couldn't it, you've got to say Mr Sinatra so the, it isn't normal is it why should I call him Mr Sinatra really and it's not and we're all human at the end of the day it's just that some of us are blessed with more talent than others that's yeah. the thing isn't it and he has an aura though I have to tell you certain mm. people as you probably know mm. but certain people do carry a something about them there, yeah. is, there is that star quality I know it's mentioned a lot but star quality is a real thing and uh, you, you know when you're in the presence of it. It's, it's rare, but it certainly exists. Laurie, thank you very much for talking to me and good luck with the Raw Variety. It is uh, a legendary production and what a thrill for you to be part of it at such a high level as well. Laurie Mansfield. Thank you very much indeed. I've really enjoyed it.